Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our community support webinar. As you know, As I Am runs a series of community support seminars around the country, usually twice a month, where we address issues of concern to the autism community, as varied as making friends to finding a job to dealing with your mental health. Uh, the present situation has made it impossible for us to host these uh, sessions at the moment. We still know that now more than ever, the autism community needs advice and support at this difficult time where there's a lot of change, not an awful lot of structure and not an awful lot of routine. So thankfully, through the support of SuperValue, we're able to continue providing this support. And today we're providing a community support webinar where we're going to be looking specifically at the impact COVID-19 is having uh, on, the well on the mental health and well-being and also the structure and routine of autistic people. Um, we're lucky to be joined by two excellent professionals in this area. We have Michael Ryan, who's a counselor and psychotherapist uh, with peaceofmind.ie. And we've Dr. Alison Doyle, uh, a leading educational psychologist who runs Cyrus. Hi. Uh, so we really appreciate both of you being here and sharing your expertise with us. Um, Yesterday, during St. Patrick's Day, we asked on our platforms if anyone had any questions. So we've also seven questions uh, to put to our experts here today directly from the community. Um, so without any further ado, um, Michael is going to speak, speak to us first of all. And Michael is going to be speaking on the topic of uh, positive mental health at this time. So we'll hand over to you, Michael. Thanks very much, Adam, and thanks for inviting me onto this forum. It's my first time to do something like this via Zoom, so uh, I'll try and get through the technicalities as best as I can. So, uh, Adam, what you've asked me to talk about today is, is, is I suppose, managing change and doing some self-care during the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. I'm not exactly sure what to call it. <coughs> I'll practice good uh, cough hygiene by coughing into my elbow, <laughs> if I have to do that. And... Um, when we look at change, I suppose th these times are extraordinary in terms of change because as of last Thursday, um, pretty much everything changed from school to community to meetings, even within our own families around how we engage with each other and how we engage with other people in our families. So with any change, it goes through a process. And I suppose the end result is that we'll end up over at the other end, which is the new status quo. Um, at the minute, uh, we're probably even past, well, we're probably in the chaos stage at the minute. So last Thursday, when the announcement was made to close schools and everything, we went into that kind of falling off the cliff kind of process. And then, the natural thing for us to do is to hit into resistance because we just like the way things are and so we want to try and get back to exactly the way things were before this crisis hit but as time goes on then we realize actually we can't just go backwards we've got to actually go forwards and we then enter into this kind of chaos stage where everything has changed and everyone gets into some kind of a panic mode really I suppose is the best way to describe it because we're trying to figure out all of the things that we need to do in order to manage this change. At the bottom you'll see us stumble and falling a bit and not really knowing what to do and that's probably another little bit of what we're at but we can already see this kind of transforming idea happening. We can see how communities are coming together in a virtual world just like we're doing here today and the new normal, which you know, a lot of people resist that term because it's, it's bandied around quite a bit, but the new normal will emerge in time. Um, so we're, we're, we're probably in these resistance, chaos, transforming and integration processes and the new status quo has really yet to be seen, but we'll get there. So for most people looking at this, we're considering about the changes in my schedule, changes in the schedule around school, changes in the schedule around home, and schedule changes in the schedule around work. And um, as with any change management, the first thing we have to do is, is acknowledge that change is inevitable, and we have to embrace it. We have no choice in this matter. This is how it is going to be. Change is, is it's integral to, to the containment of this virus. So we're just going to have to accept that change is inevitable. The best way to control our own environment is to tackle it head on. You have to acknowledge it and be proactive about taking charge of what you can control. Because otherwise we just feel out of control. 
And the only best way to deal with change is to control what we can and leave the rest to the medical professionals, the government, and those who have been trained on how to deal with crisis management. So I was going to try and find humour in the situation, and, and we noticed that this always happens whenever a crisis happens, and you'll probably have noticed in all your social media feeds that memes and videos, and even yesterday or on St. Patrick's Day, the way people had little parades around their own place. My own cousin did up a, a wheelbarrow, and she, she went out, she had a teddy bear dressed up in, in paddy whackery kind of stuff, wheeled it around her estate, people were looking out from their windows and everything. We'll find humour in this, and it does help to burst the bubble of stress. One of the best ways of dealing with change is to remind ourselves that we have successfully managed to deal with change in the past. So anybody who's thinking about exams or new ways of working at home and school and everything, you know, you've got to remind yourself, you move, you changed every year, you change teacher in primary school. You probably change classrooms a lot too if you're in a bigger school. And then you change from primary school to secondary school or secondary school to college. You've actually dealt with a lot of change in your time. And so it's, it's useful to remind ourselves at this time just how resilient we can be when we need to be and how we've managed those changes in the past. So new routines, new routines will emerge in a, in a short time. They already have in a lot of households. We're about a week into this new process. Um, I've been walking around the city the other day um, just to get out of the house, it was quite empty. The entire landscape of our city has changed and our communities. So we'll all get into a new routine. We do a lot of online communication with each other. We do a lot of online communication with schools. And in, in social isolation, this is the best way to contain the virus. And so we just have to create new routines. When you do it, then congratulate yourself and all the others around you for the flexibility and commitment to these adjustments. When we're looking at the school then in particular, um, and I know Alison, you'll probably be dealing with a lot of these things yeah. later on. So I'll just kind of fly through this. Um, just I suppose from, uh, I work in quite a few schools and quite a few people with autism um, in the schools will find the changes difficult. So I'll just go through this and maybe Alison, you'll cover them later on. Um, so school, some schools have sent out uh, work and homework in bulk. Um, some have done that last week when they sent kids home with packages of books and homework and processes as a lot of schools have been preparing for this. And then other schools will be sending out work on a daily basis. Um, and some of the, uh, well, I'll come to that in a minute. So some schools will do one-to-one -one face contact for students um, through all these various different websites and each school, well not each school has a different website, but you'd be looking at Aladdin maybe or um, Schoolology or Edmodo or some of those other ones. Another school in Rathcool I'm working with there using Microsoft Office for theirs. Some of the schools have decided to schedule the teachers to be available at the usual class times. So a science teacher who has fifth year on a Tuesday at 10.45, that teacher will be available at 10.45 for those students to communicate with. Um, some have been emailing out YouTube clips and PE teachers have been putting up workouts and, and home economics putting up cookery clips and those kind of things. Um, so it has been remarkable to see how innovative some of the schools have been in relation to how they work this new system and the amount, as much or as little communication as they deem to be necessary. And there are a lot of uh, other lesson plan websites offering good deals at the minute. Um, so I'm sure if you keep an eye on Facebook feeds, um, they'll be pumping those out to you by, by sponsored ads over the next little while. Um, so uh, just if we look at this, the house the situation is, is, is changing really. And uh, just to look at maybe some of the changes that we're looking at in the home. So um, in order to kind of deal with these changes, you've got to try and look and see how your home will look like in terms of homeschooling um, and then structure that transition within a reasonable time frame. So if you can say if, if you're going to do the classes from early morning, my sense is to work your day around the school schedule, the normal school schedule. And when it's time for School time at the kitchen table, I was kind of thinking you, you maybe can put a clock on the table to indicate this is now a time for school. 
and when it's relaxation, you take away the clock, some visual element to make it look like this is school time and that all other things are taken away because we're going to have to use the same spaces for just different things. But the visualizations get our psyche into kind of a mode of what is happening at that time. Um, obviously built in relaxation and meals and break times and, and that kind of thing also. Um, some children will need the breaks together and others separate. So, you know, kids who maybe are in primary school might need their own breaks. Perhaps your teenager might want respite from them if they're all at the same table and vice versa. Um, so a schedule for each child would be helpful. And then agree on how and who will communicate with the teacher in the school in relation to what work you're going to do on a particular day. When we look at uh, the nature of stress then, and just coping with regular stress, um, the, 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 this, this is a unique situation really because you have layers of stress in relation to this. So generally we're usually only dealing with one or two types of stress, but um, when we look at this coronavirus, we think, say at the bottom level there is our own health and the health of others. We're wondering about the economy, we're wondering about the exams coming up, then we're looking at our daily routine and then we're kind of wondering how our family will be into the future if employment is affected how are we going to deal with being separated from grandparents how are our grandparents how are the elderly people members of our family going to be so there is multi layers of stress and that's why <clears throat> you'll have noticed over the last while and um, the stress levels say coming over the airwaves on tv and radio have been extraordinary you know and some people have been um really you know really don't know what to do in this situation so i just thought i'd go through some maybe general stress busting techniques and just try and get a, a handle on what is happening in our minds so uh, when we have a thought one of the best well what happens is we have a thought it leads to a feeling it leads to a physical reaction within us and which leads to a behavior and so the easiest way to deal with all of these then is to change our thoughts so um, I'll talk about catastrophizing in a little minute. Um, and that's generally the one that comes into our minds first. Um, so I'll come to that in, in a second. I like uh, Dr. Rangan Chatterjee's um, system. Uh, now, actually, cheekily, he only had four and I have included community as this. Obviously, that element of community is going to be changed over the next while. But he reckons the four main pillars of wellness are relaxation, movement, nutrition, and sleep. And then connection with community, I think, is very important too, in whatever way we can do it now. Um, always and any good start to managing your mental health is to externalize your concerns. So it might be useful for you and anyone around you to keep a journal or a diary during this time, because eventually we will forget about all of this, but it'll be useful just to remind ourselves just how much we had to deal with during this time, because it's an extraordinary shift in uh, just our daily living in trying to work through all the changes involved in this uh, situation. So vlog blogging and um, vlogging and phone help and online support groups and online therapy and helplines. And just, I mean, on Facebook, there's pretty much a support group for pretty much every group within society and a lot of people are getting a lot of support through linking with other people in similar situations there. I would avoid the main big groups of dealing with the coronavirus stuff because there's a lot of there's a lot of falsehoods on it, there's a lot of panicking on it, there's a lot of, of, of uh, scaremongering. So I would avoid those if you can, but maybe stick to your local groups, your local community groups online, or groups within your own area of interest. So if you're a parent of somebody with autism, maybe go on to some of those parenting sites, or if you're somebody with autism, maybe go on to some of the autism sites. Um, it's always useful to turn your, your focus to creative items. Um, so maybe try and learn a new skill during this time. Um, YouTube and specific sites, there's tons of stuff on there where you can learn how to do music, art, dance, writing, all of those kind of things. Uh, I bought a harmonica a few years ago. I've never had a chance to learn it. I might just learn it now. Let's see. Um, <laughs> stick to routines and as much as you can. Um, and because the routine has changed, um, you're going to have to create new routines. Um, now, what I would suggest is that you stick to whatever school routine you have 
get up. I'm not saying you should put on your uniform. If it psychologically helps you, go for it. But at least get dressed and be ready then to hit the school books as soon as you can. St and stick to the, stick to the, the timetable in, in as best as you can. And then setting new goals. So each day, you know, I am going to try and get up and get my walk in first thing in the morning so that I'm more or less set up for the day. And uh, we now have time to do those things. So uh, I would suggest setting new goals around improving your health. Um, so maintaining calmness then spreads calmness. And uh, Dr. Uh, David Coleman had a lovely story the other day about the second chicken. But if you look at his websites, you'll, you'll see what that means. But what I was kind of thinking, you know, like the airplane approach, you know, when you see the air steward being calm, even through turbulent times, you remain calm. Um, calmness is, it, it, panic is easy to spread, but also calmness is easy to spread. And if you're ever getting into an argument with somebody and their volume goes up, if you maintain your volume, they can't go anywhere with theirs and eventually they come back down. And so that kind of calmness is what we need so that everyone remains, um, I suppose, that they feel that they're in a trusted and cared for environment. So you can only control your own home environment. So follow the guidelines um, and leave the rest to those who know what to do. So in some ways, you know, I kind of feel I'm, I'm not a doctor. So I just leave the medical stuff to those who've gone to college to train for it. And if I get ill, well, I, um, that's kind of down to them to fix it for me or do whatever they can for me. Um, so I'm not actually going to worry about the health element of it. I'll just do my best to keep myself as best as I can and follow all the good hy uh, hand hygiene and coughing hygiene regulations and do the self-isolation and do the social distancing and all of that. And um, then if I do fall ill, then uh, I'll just have to turn to the medics to try and figure out what to do. Um, so. If you're panicked, stressed, worried, or anxious, you've got to ask yourself how this strategy is helping. So really what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a conversation between the, what we call the reptilian part of your brain, this kind of first bit that developed many, many years ago. And you're trying to get it to have a little chat with this logical part at the front. The logical part of the front will tell you, panic is not going to get me anywhere. Worrying is not going to get me anywhere. Stressing is not going to get me anywhere. As long as I can do is follow the best guidelines that I can. And after that, um, I have to just leave it into nature's hands to do it as she, as she wishes, wishes, the same as she does every winter with colds and flus and whatever other medical stuff that can happen. So if you try, when somebody says, you know, you need to calm down and take a few deep breaths, the deep breaths in themselves do something, not as much though as just taking a couple of seconds to get out of this part of your brain and up to this part of your brain. And when you're in this part of your brain, you say, well, look, I'm doing everything I can. There's nothing else I can do. I'm washing my hands. I'm coughing into my elbow. I'm social isolating and doing all that. And um, then you say, well, that's all I can do, actually, you know. Whenever you do feel stressed, doing what we call progressive muscular relaxation is great. And there's a whole ton of stuff on YouTube. They're about 20 minutes long. And what they do is to get you to scrunch up bits of your body at different times. So you scrunch up your face, scrunch up your hands, scrunch up your arms, your legs, and so on and so forth. And what that does is it creates a little bit of tension within your system, and then you relax. And so your brain then says, oh, okay, that tension has gone. I need to actually send some, some chemicals down there to kind of relax that body. So you almost force the tension, and then you let it relax. And your brain then catches up with that. And by the end of the whole process, you will feel much more relaxed. There's loads of stuff about meditation, breathing exercises, and mindfulness. And if you've never done them before, it's a really good time because you probably often heard lots of stuff about meditation, mindfulness and all of that. And you say, what's all this about? And it's a good time to look into that. And it's, they're good, good practices to have every day in any event. So then allow uh, time for family check-ins with each child and with each partner. And, and for any of the children, they should check in with their parents just to see how they're doing. Um, so again, what, what we would generally say is, <clears throat> in regular circumstances, we'd say for children to hold on to their worries until a particular part of the day. If they wish, they can write them down, put them into a worry jar, and then at specific times of the day, you can come and deal with them, rather than having them drip, drip fed all the time. It depends on the level of stress of the child that's in your life. Um, they may need to, to 
talk to you as, as the worries come up. But it is helpful if they can write them down, put them in a jar or a box somewhere, and then be dealt with later on, because they do have to learn to contain their anxiety and then deal with it. It's like all of us, when we, when we go to work, you leave your worries at home, you get through your day, and then later on, you, because you learned how to contain them, you know you'll deal with them later on. And children do need to, to learn that. So you know by the level of anxiety of, of the people in your lives who needs to be constantly reassured and who can learn a little bit of restraint and containment during this time. Uh, as with any day, it's always good to remind yourself to be grateful of everything that you have and practicing gratitude does help to bring a little bit of calmness to the mind when you're, when you're getting into panic mode. Um, so scheduling your access to updates on, on social media um, on the, the situation and only use reliable sources. So I've heard that so many times over the last few days about taking social media breaks and trying to, to ensure that you're not overwhelmed with all of this news because there's so much of it and most of it is right, but a lot of it is wrong and the stuff that's wrong is, is very scaremongering. So um, I would use just reliable sites to get your information and um, and don't have it on drip feed all day long. And then I'm not promoting Lyric FM particularly, but <laughs> um, I think if you can switch off from the social media and switch on to something that's more relaxing, so rather than have the news and constant in the background in your house, to have some other more, whether that's pop music, or classical music, whatever suits you best, um, rather than a constant stream of news. So that's kind of the main thrust of stuff for today. Uh, I think we'll probably be revisiting this um, in the coming weeks as well. So um, I think that's that's all for today. Thank you uh, so much, Michael. Uh, huge food for thought there. And uh, we're going to come back with a, a few questions for you, if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, so next up, um, we have Alison Doyle who's going to speak about some of these issues, maybe from more a school and education perspective. Okay. I'm just going to start there. Can you um, stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Okay, let me start my screen here. Okay, hi everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for uh, sharing that with us. I'm just waiting for this to come up. It's being a bit slow here, uh, as I'm sure you're all already experiencing a um, little bit of a problem with broadband, depending on where you're living. Um, right. I'm just going to probably reiterate actually quite a lot of what Michael's already said to you, hopefully with uh, some useful links, etc. So top tips for busting board and why is that important? Well, Michael has already spoken about uh, the value of adhering to a routine. It's very important because boredom has a tendency to allow intrusive thoughts to creep in. And we want to interrupt anxious thoughts. Uh, and the best way of doing that is by engaging in doing. So these are my top tips for trying to uh, avoid that kind of boredom, avoid anxious thoughts whilst we're all stuck at home. All of these ideas require you to use the same parts of your brain as those that you learn uh, use during your learning in the classroom and indeed the same skills. So all of these activities are good for you. They'll have a positive impact on your happiness and well-being. So your brain is wired to keep to a routine, waking up, having breakfast, getting dressed, leaving the house. So it's a very good idea to keep to the same routine or keep to establish a similar routine, if you like, even if you are at home. Otherwise, your brain might get confused if you stop doing the things that you would normally do, uh, because that tends to um, sort of kick off uh, a loss of focus or of interest. So make a daily or a weekly plan. Maybe it's better to make a daily plan. Uh, the choice is yours, to engage in that choice. It's a very good idea, as Michael said, to get dressed. And I'm not suggesting that you put on your school uniform. Staying in your pyjamas uh, might sound great, but it communicates to your brain that you are in a kind of rest or sleep mode. So by getting dressed and being active, 
perhaps uh, going out of the house, walking around, getting dressed as if you were going to school or going somewhere, the same as your mum and dad probably will be doing, um, can make a big difference to the way that you engage with your environment. So in terms of what to do, is there something that you were really, really interested in? Michael mentioned um, taking up harmonica, for example, something that perhaps he hadn't previously had time to do. Do you enjoy being left alone to get on with making, doing, finding out, but you're often interrupted and in being asked to do something else, or you have to go to school, or you have to go out? Well, now is your chance. Get started on a project, for example, knit an underwater kingdom, design a new civilization, write a play, produce a podcast, create an interactive family tree with voiceovers perhaps, design a vegetable garden, solve a problem that your parents have. There's a really useful website here, um, diy.org, which has tons of really interesting and useful project suggestions that you could get started on. It isn't very often that we actually have time to learn something new and indeed to practice that new skill. So as Michael said, take advantage. It could be something interesting like playing an instrument or learning Japanese. Perhaps now is the time to learn how to cook a meal or indeed operate the washing machine. Perhaps there's um, a broken piece of equipment, a broken radio or a laptop at home that's essentially nobody uses anymore. Take it apart, figure out how it works. Learn how stuff works. Give yourself an opportunity to say, I can do that. It's a very positive feeling to have. Um, practice your maths eyes. This is a very interesting set of resources here. Everybody uses maths every day uh, in everyday life, and perhaps you don't always realize it. So getting your maths eyes on can help you to see things differently, and it can also help you to figure out complicated problems. There are some really interesting mind-bending activities in this resource pack. There are teacher and tutor instructions in there, so it's very easy for parents to use and to help you to use it as well. And that way, you will feel that you are still staying on top of maths activities. Are you a creative person? Do you like making and doing? There are 50 great ideas here from Good Housekeeping to stretch your mind, to get you actively doing, and they enabled you to make some uh, quite cheery decorations for the home as well. In terms of staying active, as Michael said, it's really important. It's a very important part of well-being and mental health is being and staying active. Uh, especially if you are spending extended amounts of time in front of a computer screen. If that's the case, take a regular break at least once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Being active makes you feel less anxious or stressed. It activates endorphins. There are tons of things to do indoors as well as outdoors. I know that we're all in a big panic about toilet roll and you can see on, here on screen, there's a very nice obstacle course here using toilet roll. You can still use it afterwards if you're careful. Uh, you could also use crepe paper perhaps. You could use knitting wool. Um, build an obstacle horse, of course, make a treasure hunt. You could engage in something like hallway bowling. You can use empty plastic bottles with a small amount of water or little stones in them. Um, get yourself a hula hoop, teach your animal, your pet to do some tricks. There are quite a lot of things to do if you just think about it really carefully. It's very important to give a helping hand to those around us and that includes your parents and your siblings. There are always chores to be done. Uh, I know that's a bit eye rolly and um, I can hear people groaning across the land, but being helpful again gives you a good feeling. It releases chemicals called endorphins into your brain and this will keep you uh, happy and well. And actually you might also pick up a few new skills along the way. In terms of schooling, um, if you're taking exams in June, please do not panic. By this time of the year, your teachers will have made sure that you have covered all of the curriculum. From this period onwards, um, it's straightforward revision. You have all of those tools at your disposal. Your teachers and your schools are providing you with online materials and lessons, and as Michael said, YouTube clips. 
you can use this time to make a study plan leading up to your uh, exam period. We don't, we're not sure yet what is going to happen, but we will just carry on. We're going to keep calm, carry on, continue with our revision as we normally would do. I've got an example here in Microsoft Excel. It's very easy to create. You could ask somebody to help you. Um, it's handy to remember that the most effective way of studying is to stay within the topic, but switch the activity. And this is what this Pomodoro technique on the right hand side is. You can stay within, for example, let's take a geography topic like volcanoes, but you can switch the activity. Watch something, listen to something, read your notes, test yourself on some flashcards, listen to an audio podcast, and that keeps your brain engaged. But don't forget to take a break. This can be as simple as running around your garden, walking up and down your street, or just taking a break and listening to some music in a darkened room. When you create this study plan in Excel, you can use the useful study uh, clips, YouTube clips or podcasts that your teachers have given you to populate that plan. If you're a college student, the same technique applies. You may be very concerned about annual exams, particularly if you're in your final year. College authorities are working on this, do not worry. If you are registered with a disability service in college, all of those colleges are maintaining contact with students. Email them, call them. What are they going to do about exams? We're not sure yet. It's possible either, either there'll be an online exam instead, or you may get an, another assignment, or they may, might give you an open book examination. Keep checking your college email account for updates. And just finally, I would like to stress that it's really important to read every day, uh, whether that be a magazine, a comic, um, a newspaper, a book. Firstly, it stimulates your brain. It does reduce stress. It improves your memory. It's teaching you new vocabulary and it's building your knowledge. So stay calm be safe and if you have any questions you can always ask us thank you so much Alison and um, that was really uh, insightful as well and certainly what I took from it is that DIY website sounds fantastic so I might uh, check oh it's great it. <laughs> very exciting so I think there's there's lots of food for thought and what's brilliant is following the discussion yesterday I think a lot of the sort of questions we're asking I think both Michael and Alison you've already touched on them in your presentation but I have taken the questions as they appeared online. I've taken the names away. Um, and I was hoping that we could ask you guys to speak uh, to the questions that have been raised by the community. Um, so the first question we have is from a mom. And it says, thanks. It's difficult to support a family member who has learning disabilities and is on the autistic spectrum. How can I explain the dramatic change to lifestyle routine and staff absence because I'm self-isolating? The most difficult challenge for me is a mom of a young man. Thanks for your amazing proactive approach. Keep safe. Michael, would you be able to speak a little bit more to some of those challenges about, I suppose, uh, the lack of routine? And I suppose specifically, if somebody's been asked to self-isolate, um, <clears throat> how, how, how people can get through this period? Yeah, um, it is a difficult situation, obviously. And it is just, I suppose, at the, the, at the extreme end of how somebody has had to make those changes in their lives, you know, in, the, in terms of self-isolation, because a lot of other people can get out and about at least and, and meet others, but, um, well, even meet them in the park or something like that, somewhere in, the, in an outside space. Mm -hmm. But when you're in self-isolation, it's difficult. And then, obviously, if there's somebody that you're caring for, they're obviously in the same situation also. So look, I mean, one of the most important things is, is to let them know <clears throat> just that you realize just how difficult it is for them, that you need to remain calm and you need to show them that you're in control, that you're able to deal with this. And a bit like what I was saying earlier, when you display that calmness, they will feel reassured that they will feel that they're in a trusted space. Um, what you need to remind um, the person who, who you're caring for there is that they have been through lots of other challenges and changes before. And just try and remind them of the times when they have dealt with other family crises. Try and remind them of other changes in routines. Try and just remind them that they got through those times um, successfully. 
And even though they were difficult initially, that eventually things settled down. So they have, you know, that person has probably dealt with different members of personnel. I think that that person was saying that there has been a change in personnel, maybe uh, maybe people who come to the house to to do other elements of care, respite or occupation therapy or whatever it is. So they've probably had changes in personnel over time and they have dealt with those successfully. Family dynamics have probably changed over time and they have dealt with those successfully, you know. So um, one of the things is to try and set a new routine for um, the family, however big or small it is. And that will probably require them to post it up, to actually make a visual of it and put it up so that each step of the day is outlined in the new normal, the new status quo. And reassure them then that this is how things will be so that the shape of that becomes quite apparent very quickly. And people will get into that new routine and new regime quite quickly. It'll be difficult because boredom will set in um, that sense of isolation will set in if they could um, in any way see how that person can can communicate with their friends or other people that maybe they had met at clubs or in centers or schools or wherever that they were doing their their daily activities um, and just see if then maybe what i was thinking of was maybe any of the staff um, if there was a possibility for those staff to check in in some way or another, either video call or FaceTime or something like that, um, just to maybe reassure the person that as soon as things settle down, that they'll be back. Or else try and create a new routine whereby that person can, can provide the support via online, some kind of process like this, um, so that the isolation is, is at a minimum as best as it can. I don't know the situation for those personnel, whether they have been let off, whether they are still engaged or active or whatever the situation is. But um, even just from a person to person point of view, they may just um, be able to send a message of reassurance to, to her son. That's really helpful, thanks. And I just wanted to mention as well, it might be worth checking out As I Am's social story that covers self-isolation. It might be a, a useful resource. And obviously, as the situation develops, it is going to get difficult for people and there is possibly challenges that we haven't even identified here yet today, which is an important message to say as well as as I am is still at work. And at any stage, as you're trying to navigate some of these things, if you need an advice or steering or a bit of signposting, um, info at as I am is still being manned and hopefully we'll be able to give advice as the situation develops. Yeah, and I think this is where the value of uh, social stories really comes into its own and perhaps we can uh, collaboratively work on a, a bank of different stories for different scenarios. And I think it's also important to, to sit down and take the time to explain that why some people work at home and are working from home and that it's, it's a not um, abnormal thing to do. It's not unusual. A large amount of the workforce do so. And that to just try and uh, normalize this context so that it's not seen as something quite scary or unusual. Absolutely. The next one comes from an autistic student, Alison. Um, how do you deal with changes in workload, college and school, and the uncertainty of when class or workload cannot be given in advance? For autistic people like me, like me need the reassurance of knowing how much, what is due and when between uncertainty and needing to work twice as hard as an inverted commas normal student, I'm anxious that myself and other autistic students and workers will have to face burnout and unnecessary stress just to keep up um, with all the hard work. So somebody is quite stressed there, um, for sure. Okay, so from a college a student perspective, first of all, there is no real change in the workload um, because you will have been given assignment deadlines either in your course handbook or um, in your Blackboard or Moodle system. So you should know when your pieces of work are due. So the um, sensible thing to do is to look at all your different deadlines, insert them into a calendar and work backwards. So when do I need to start that piece of work? When do I need to start the, the reading uh, or the researching and then the writing up the drafts? Um, at the moment, we have to work to deadlines, whether they be assignment deadlines or exam deadlines, as they have been given. So we just adhere to those deadline goals. They may possibly change in the future, 
Uh, it's more likely that it will be at, that they will be extended into the future or cancelled altogether. But all we can do is stick to the deadlines that we're given. And if you do that, you can't go wrong. Uh, I'm not sure about your own arrangements uh, with school or college, but I'd like to think that your teachers or your lecturers have provided some guidelines in terms of are you emailing pieces of work to them? Do you have to submit them online? It's really important if you're using a virtual learning environment like Blackboard or Moodle that you keep checking in every, every day to see if there are any announcements. Keep checking your email in case you get instructions from individual lecturers. Uh, are they setting additional piece of work? If you're at school, are they setting homework? Ask each teacher to provide a study schedule and due dates for each piece of homework, for example, and then make yourself a timetable as suggested in the web webinar. In terms of college workload, as I said, you already have your deadlines, adhere to these, your course materials and your course handbooks contain recommended and essential readings. And you should complete these using remote access to your college library. You can log in and at least read the journal articles and the eBooks, even if you can't access the printed books. You carry on in exactly the same way as you would have done. Your occupation as a student, it's Monday to Friday, nine to five. You fill that time with your students' activities and uh, that should keep you on track. Just both Alison and Michael, you both have uh, experience, I suppose, uh, in, in school settings. And I know Alison, um, you have a background working in the disability services um, in university. I know many people in our community often struggle, even when things are operating normally, to know actually where and how to go about asking for help at this time. So if you're a student and you're in school and you're under pressure, or if you're in college and you're under pressure, how can people still reach out to their, their school or college authorities now and ask for support if they need it? Well, in terms of colleges, they, uh, each school or department should have set up a method of communication with their college students. So some of them might have Facebook groups, some of them might have WhatsApp groups, but certainly all announcements and all materials and all instructions as to what to do will, as I say, be on Blackboard or Moodle. You do have access to the disability service. I know uh, we're operating fully in Trinity College. So for example, this morning, I was Skyping with students in terms of managing an assignment. Um, do contact them. They have already sent out emails with all of the details on as to how to contact staff in the disability service. Uh, we're using Microsoft Teams, uh, we're using video, we're using online chat. So even if you were worried about, for example, how to contact your history department, you can ask that question of the disability service and they will help you out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was just going to maybe address the question of the burnout, Adam, if that's okay, to, to try and avoid the burnout. <clears throat> so, I mean, <laughs> in some ways I was kind of thinking, uh, um, I was talking to a student last week, you know, and he was concerned about two things. One, that he, he didn't know how to structure the homework and the work that was going to be done. So in some ways he felt he, he was going to be overwhelmed with the amount of work to be done between now and say the junior cert. Mm -hmm. And his concerns really were whether he was going to have too much work to do over the next couple of months in the absence of a teacher to help him, or whether he was actually not going to get enough work done over the next couple of months mm -hmm. to get a good result in the junior cert, you know, and both very valid points, you know. So a little bit like what Alison was saying there, I'd be suggesting people try and stick to their timetable in as best as they can. So if they have a period of Irish, then do that yep. period of Irish. And then take a break because you'd have a couple of minutes between moving from one classroom to the next. And before you get stuck into the next one, maybe get up from the table, walk around the house a little bit. Do, do, just take those few minutes that you would get in any event. Take your breaks as they would be scheduled during the day as well. And only eat at those times also and try and get in some exercise at the what we call the little lunch and the big lunch and um like alison was saying the the secondary schools and colleges are probably best set up in relation to how you're communicating with your teachers you know they have the most students have email addresses in which they can communicate with the teacher and again the schools have asked that you just communicate during school times as normal and um if, if it's a thing that you were at home in relation to pa uh, past papers are a great indication of how well you're doing. 
to try and work your way through all of the past papers over the next couple of months. Because as it turns out, fortuitously at this time of the year, everyone had been preparing for mocks. Say we're talking specifically about the junior cert and leaving cert students at this point. But everyone had been preparing for the mocks. So as it turns out, most of the curriculum had been covered um, by the end of February in any event. Mm -hmm. So most people would be in very much um, a, a revisionary process now. And you know what? I mean, and a lot of the challenges that, that a lot of the students I work with face is distraction and disruption from unruly students. So take advantage of this yeah. time when you actually you can have a 40 minute Irish lesson with no distraction from a couple of other yahoos in the class who are constantly <laughs> um, disrupting the situation and, and that you have this, you'd probably find that you're able to focus better, you're able to concentrate better and you'll get into a pattern of this timetable and what to do over the next little while and just mm -hmm. be guided by your curriculum and be guided by the past papers. Um, <clears throat> just the other thing is just remember you can only do so much in any given day mm -hmm. and just like you're getting you would be getting through school you know you do know that you, have, you still have other stuff to revise between now and June but trust yourself that you will get there you know you have another two and a half months or so before the exams so only do whatever you can in any given day and then as you as you're going to bed that night just satisfy yourself that you've done all you can for that day and that tomorrow you'll do another bunch of stuff you know um, and just also, like I was saying before, remind yourself that you have dealt with change in the past. You have dealt with challenging situations in the past. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and you'll deal with this change and you'll get through this time. Very good advice. Um, this is the, the million dollar question I think we're asking, <laughs> guys. I don't think anyone here is going to know the answer to this, but I think it's a question that everybody is asking. And I think it's a question that certainly for junior cert and leaving cert students, it is causing anxiety. So... Alison, you might be best placed to, to, to have a stab at this one. Um, <laughs> how can you deal with the uncertainty of when state exams will be on? So students who've prepared, who June has been a big date in their head, and people are wondering, what if, what if, what if? Um, what would you say to students in that scenario? Well, it is a difficult question because there hasn't been very much communication on this. It's a, it's a very big task for governments who reorganise exams. And I know that they're working on this. Uh, well, certainly working on alternative arrangements for junior and leaving certain examinations. Perhaps they'll go ahead at the scheduled time. Perhaps they won't. But as I said previously, all we can do is work to the current plan that we have. I'm perfectly sure that, as Michael said, everybody has been practicing. The curriculum has more or less been completed. We're now in a revision period. You stick to the schedule that had been determined for you to take, uh, revise for and take your examinations. Oral and oral examinations are expected to be cancelled. That doesn't mean that you can't still practice this. If you have a classmate who has Skype or Zoom indeed, you can uh, practice, engage in some oral practice of your language subjects with a friend, uh, a relative and other classmates. With respect to the uncertainty around um, written examinations, we have to work on the assumption that the Department of Education will have identified a solution by the time it comes to the beginning of June. It's not for you to worry about that, it's for the people in charge to worry about that. You stick to your plan, you keep going. Um, reassure your, your sons, your daughters that this is absolutely the best approach. Continue on with your study plans, maintain the schedule, maintain the schedule set by the school. And I think it's helpful also to reassure people that uh, virtual learning, uh, virtual study is a, is a very normal part of everyday life in other parts of the world due to geographical distances. In Australia, for example, children engage in uh, remote learning or online or distance learning. It's a new way of working for us, but it's not unusual. Um, it's helpful if parents, if you can find as many examples as you can of the w way in which they do this in the rest of the world, and to also reassure uh, your children that many people work remotely, call centers, for example, online software solutions, banking. Um, this is how many children people work. This is uh, how we probably will come to work more in the future. Um, so we just need to keep going with what we're doing. You keep going with your study in, a, in the best way that you can and leave other people to worry about when the exams are going to happen. Brilliant, sound advice. Um, 
Michael, this is something, this next one that you touched on in your presentation, but I don't know if you'd like to add anything specifically. Uh, this person is wondering about how you can deal with catastrophizing the current situation, uh, something that obviously cripples a lot of people. Um, I wonder. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, like catastroph catastrophizing actually is, is a, it's a normal brain process and it's what the brain does when it doesn't know how to cope with an, a kind of an unfamiliar territory. And the cat catastrophizing is really your brain trying to protect you. So it tries to come up with all of the different things that can go wrong. But the problem is there's so many things in life and there's so many uncertainties that actually you can't deal with them all. And so it catastrophizes. And I'm reminded by, <clears throat> reminded by a, a saying by a guy called, um, I can't think of his name now, but his, his uh, saying was, my life has been filled by a whole series of misfortunes, most of which never happened. <laughs> and um, this is kind of what catastrophizing is. And it's a little bit like, it, it, it's again, it's the bottom part of our brain uh, impulsively trying to come up with all kinds of situations that we need to prepare for. But the logical part of our brain is, 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 is a better one to be in control. So again, I'd ask you to have a little chat from one part of your brain to the other. And what my logical brain usually says is, thank you very much. If ever I feel kind of panicked or anything, I then realize the brain has kind of recognized there's some danger, there's something to worry about. And I say, listen, thank you very much. I appreciate that you're doing your best to prepare me for everything, but I got this. I'm going to be able to deal with this. And so I move my thinking from there right up to a more developed part of my brain which allows me to kind of say, okay, listen, as long as I need to do, I need to keep washing my hands, I need to practice good hygiene, I need to social um, distance myself and do those kind of things. And, and then leave, leave the rest to the experts, you know. So in, in a way, you should thank that part of your brain for, for kind of trying to do its best and, you know, it's working very hard. But what happens is, let's say this is, this is logic and this is catastrophizing. What happens is you switch it around to say, listen, the logic is in control here. Thank you very much, but we got this, you know. And you just switch your thinking around it, which switches your feelings around it, which then switches your behaviors and your physical reactions to it, you know. Um, yeah. So that's what I'd say about catastrophizing, yeah. Really interesting. Um, question five. At times of stress and ill health, I am prone to panic attacks, especially in the middle of the night. These can be terrorizing and I lose control and a sense of perspective. Any advice on how I can help myself, particularly if I become unwell? Panic attacks, Michael, is that something that you... Yeah, yeah. Again, the panic attacks are very much in that kind of catastrophizing region, you know. So one of the things to do again, you know, if you're panicking, again, take back the control from the logical part of your brain and just to thank your brain. Yes, I know you're, you're doing your best there to try and come up with all kinds of things. Panic is a little bit different to catastrophizing in that sometimes you can't really identify what you're panicking about. Whereas with catastrophizing, you generally do. And um, so the panic is a little bit different. So the way the best way to kind of deal with that is is to practice a few maybe good um he, this person was talking about particularly at night time or in the middle of the night you know so what i would say is in order to prepare yourself for maybe the avoidance of panic attack is to to, to stop that constant switch of social media drip feeding of bad news and all that kind of stuff you know so don't overindulge in that kind of stuff the regular kind of things around um, prior to going to sleep, none of that blue light business, you know, of, of staring at your phone and that kind of thing in bed. So if you're reading, it's about reading a book, if you can, by just the bedside lamp as opposed to the light from your phone. All of the kind of usual sleep hygiene things. Um, to prepare yourself, uh, particularly in this time when we're cooped up in the house, you still need, where at all possible, to leave your bedroom as the place where you sleep as opposed to where you watch TV or eat or do any of those things. Now, I know in some ways we have to use them as study rooms and that kind of thing. But when you're getting, excuse me, when you're getting ready for bed, it's important to just kind of use that time to prepare yourself. So getting into your pajamas and um, so you'll have had to get dressed earlier in the day in order to do that. It starts to prepare you then for, for actually that this is bedtime and psychologically you'll start to prepare proper kind of what we call sleep hygiene 
Um, if you do happen to wake up in the middle of the night with the panic, you know, again, say thank you to your brain. Yes, I know you're doing your best. And then the progressive muscular relaxation, which you can do in bed, which is about scrunching up the muscles and relaxing them, it forces your brain to produce the relaxing chemicals. Um, if you need to, you could use your ear pods or whatever it is to listen to some kind of relaxation, um, like the CAM app or the some meditation app or again just some classical music or something like that which might help you drift off. You need to remind yourself too that nobody has ever died from a panic attack. It is just your brain in overreaction. This will pass. All panic attacks pass and eventually things settle back down, you know. Um, the other thing this person was concerned about was if they do actually get ill, you know, um, again what they kind of do in relation to panicking around that and the truth is Again, they're not trained medics. If you get ill, you get onto the hse.ie, you look at what the, the best guidance is, they'll advise you as best what to do. And most people will get through this with the regular cold and flu reaction and recover from it in the regular cold and flu reaction. So um, if they get ill, follow the HSE guidelines and just do what they suggest and most likely everything will be fine. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, question six, how to cope with uncertainty and as days go into weeks and the unknown? As schoolwork can be accepted in school environment, how do I help them to adapt to schooling in a home environment? Social isolation is a conform. How best to, ha to help keep pushing comfortably into helping into with social skills? Other day-to-day -day tips uh, with also limited access to favourite food too. There's a lot there and I think there's a lot that we've covered. So maybe yeah. specifically that I wanted just maybe to touch on is, I suppose, the social aspect. And um, We've talked a lot about school, we've talked a lot about mental health, but obviously people who it's important maybe to have the opportunity to see friends, to continue to be making friends, to be going to favourite clubs and activities. Is there any tips or suggestions in that area? Um, I think that would be particularly helpful here. Well, I think, you know, one thing that could be done is actually to turn this current situation into something more positive. So in terms of keeping going with schoolwork in a home, home environment, now your, your son or daughter has the opportunity to actually construct their own timetable. So whilst, as Michael says, uh, it's perhaps a good idea to stick to what would be happening in your, the usual school day, turn it into a choice. You have a choice. Normally today you'd be doing... Irish, maths, geography, history, uh, and science. Uh, it's probably a good idea that we still do that today. How about you choose? You choose which of these you do and in what order. Look at your subjects, decide on what the, uh, the best time of day to study is for each subject. Uh, according to your mood or interest or fatigue, you might find it easier to do, you know, geography in the morning, for example, maths in the afternoon. But the, it's quite positive to be given a choice in when and, and how you do these things. So help him to make the decisions that may give him a really good feeling of empowerment. Social skills can be encouraged by, as we said before, by linking virtually with another classmate or perhaps a relative, perhaps a cousin, a close friend, uh, just to have a chat about what were you doing today? What are you focusing on? Uh, have you got any good ideas? Did you find any good YouTube clips? Uh, something like that. Uh, and I think also engaging in, um, I know there's some concerns over screen time and video gaming. There are so many really good interactive educational games. Uh, for example, world building, team building, discovery games. I have a, a list of them actually somewhere that I thought I had to hand today, but I can't find them. Um, some of those world building games, you can engage with other people. So that is a, another form of communication and engagement outside of the home. Brilliant. And our very final question today, um, how to explain to a young person who is autistic what coronavirus is and about the changes we've had to make and the changes in routine, how to offer reassurance to someone experiencing the autistic spectrum. I think it's a really interesting question just maybe that we I might just get a, a comment from from both of you we've talked about limiting access to the news we've talked about where we get our information from I suppose actually understanding the coronavirus explaining what it is how, what's the best way to go about that 
Um, yeah, I, I just, maybe you might want to say something, Alison, in a second. Um, I just thought, um, for one, it's about, again, like what we we're saying, just trying to keep calm and use a calm voice when you're explaining it. I think the first thing to do is maybe to ask them what they already know about it, what they already, mm. what information they've already picked up. So you can then maybe dispel any falsehoods or myths that, that maybe they have about it, which, which they've picked up from wherever. Um, and then to try and maybe explain that this is a flu like every other flu. It is a cold like every other cold. And uh, the, the difference with this one is they haven't come up with a vaccine yet or they haven't come up with a, a medication to deal with it. So the first thing we have to do is try and avoid catching it. And that's what all the social isolation is about. Reassure them too that the pharmacology or the, the medical people are dealing with trying to come up with the, um, a cure for it and that that actually should be coming down the line fairly, fairly soon. Um, to, to remind them, you know, that, that um, they have gotten over colds before and most people who get this cold and flu will get over this also. That um, like with any illness, some people who, who are already maybe sick this might just be too much for them, you know. But that's really only if they're older. I wouldn't be saying that to, to younger children, you know. But the reality is that older children will realize that um, elderly people are vulnerable because their immune system is suppressed. Uh, I would try and be as open, as honest as you can. Again, you're talking like, you know, children, the developmental stage and age is important to consider here, you know. And again, age, and stage sometimes don't always match for each child, so you have to be careful of their developmental stage. Um, I think honesty is probably the best way to go in a lot of it. Dispelling myths is, is important, like I said, and just to remind them that most people who get this would be perfectly fine. I think it's very, well, we're, we're somewhat limited in the advice that we can give uh, people individually because obviously we don't know your children mm -hmm. or young people and uh, how they are likely to react to uh, information given in certain ways. As I am, I've written a very good social story about this. I know there's some very, very good um, uh, online videos on explaining coronavirus uh, professionally done by um, health authorities so I would say that that's the best place to start and is to perhaps watch it yourself take a view on uh, whether it's uh, high quality or not uh, select one to watch sit down with your children to watch it and then have a discussion afterwards you know what questions do you have is it is something that you need me to explain in a little bit more depth because by using a um, high quality professional video uh, you know that the information is correct the other thing adam just to maybe just to say is that people feel good when they can take control of a situation yeah. so you could ask the child what they can do and then you're again you're talking about the good hand hygiene good cough and sneeze etiquette and then ask them, how do you think they can help in this situation? So that could be around, well, what about if we do FaceTime with Granny and Granddad? What about if we, um, mm. you know, link in with her friends or over some kind of play date on, on Zoom or something else similar to this kind of a forum? Um, you know, ask them what they can do. And when they feel then that they're doing the right things and they have taken some bit of control, made some suggestion and then followed through, it, they'll feel empowered in, the, in this situation. That's exactly, absolutely right. And I think perhaps a, another good starting point is to to ask them what they think they know about coronavirus, because then you get a better understanding of perhaps where there is a misunderstanding. Thank you so much. Well, what I just want to say is a huge thank you to both yourself, Alison, and to Michael for providing the seminar today. Uh, the guys only got a couple of days notice that we wanted to do. <laughs> and really pulled out all the stops, developing PowerPoints and everything. I think both of them told me they were only going to speak for five to ten minutes, but I think we've been here <laughs> minutes. Sorry. <laughs> no, I think it's fantastic. It just shows uh, the huge amount of thought, but also the huge expertise you both have in this area. And maybe the last thing I was going to ask you both to do uh, is that maybe when people have heard this today, maybe people are looking for professional support at present. Are both your services still in operation? And yeah. how can people get in touch if they are? Well, yeah, um, yeah, email is probably the best uh, email or uh, text message and uh, we can certainly do something over Zoom or uh, something over Skype. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. Yeah, online. We're, it's not best practice to see people in person at this point, but definitely uh, online process. So yeah, on the website, there's my contact details. Yeah. Thank you so much. And once again, I want to say a huge thank you as well to Super Value for sponsoring this webinar and for making it possible. And also to uh, all the people who sent us questions and engaged online. We hope you found this useful. Let us know if you did, because hopefully it's something as the virus progresses, we can certainly look at uh, another one looking at this topic, but also maybe other topics uh, while we're all sure. cooped up at home, we can all learn a little bit more. So thank you all very much. Uh, You're welcome. And we wish you uh, a good day. Pleasure. Take Pleasure. care.